But uh, I just want to lift one verse from 1 Samuel 17. What's crazy is I've never actually preached from this chapter of Scripture, ever. I ain't never touched this story, one of the most familiar stories um, in, the, in the Scriptures. But I just want to lift one verse, verse number 37. When you have it, let me know at the sound of amen. David said... The Lord, who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. I want to tag this text um, with this thought an underdog story an underdog story an underdog story you all may well know by this point i am a sports enthusiast i love i love sports not just cuz i played or coached or anything like that. I, I'm coming to realize the older I get, part of the reason I love sports is the human interest stories or, or more specifically the fact that it is reality TV on display. And like many of you, I love a good underdog story. It, 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 is, it is why people who are not super fans of college basketball gather every spring and fill out brackets and play in job pools because we love a good underdog story. And we, we watch with great intentionality to see if the Cinderella team can beat the higher seeded super team because we love a good underdog story. There is a reason why boxing fans will never forget the name James Buster Douglas because one random night in 1990 in Tokyo, he knocked out the baddest man on the planet in his prime, Mike Tyson. It's why people who can't even skate know the story of the 19. 1980 USA hockey team that upset the undefeated Soviet Union in Lake Placid, New York. Do you believe in miracles yet? You remember the call because we love a good underdog story. But I, I love the part that happens after the upset. I love the interview. After everybody in the world is surprised and shocked by the upset, after everybody in the world seems to celebrate the fact that the person and the team that they thought could not do it does it, the, the, the media members, the commentators run to the, to the underdog that has been victorious and puts a microphone in their face and says, nobody thought you could do it. Nobody expected your team to win. How in the world did you overcome all the odds? And there is something that seems to be universal when an underdog is interviewed. The, the universal idea when an underdog is asked how they did it, it seems to surmise to the reality that although the world said they were underdogs, they never saw themselves as underdogs. The reason they're called underdogs is because of what everybody else says about them, not what they say about themselves. They're underdogs because the betters and the, the gamblers and the Vegas odds say there's no chance they should win. But, but, but they never believe the report of the world. Because underdogs know that although you say it ain't possible, I know 
what I'm capable of. This seems to be the idea around our text today. You, you, you know, may know this story if you grew up in Sunday school, but allow me to tell you what's happening in the context of 1 Samuel chapter number 17. There is a young boy, a young shepherd boy named David who has recently been told one day he'll be the next king. But after being anointed as king, he goes back to tending his father's sheep. Being a shepherd was a lowly job. You sat out in the field all day, made sure these sheep didn't wander off. They stayed together. They grazed where they were supposed to graze. And every now and then you had to protect the sheep from their own foolishness because sheep are dumb enough to run off and get into stuff that they have no business getting into, wandering into places they have no business wandering, eating stuff they have no business, just foolish. And every now and then the, the most exciting part of this job was going to look after some foolish sheep that wandered off. It was a lowly job. It was a job that did not have very much um, positive uh, press in that day and age. They thought shepherds were swindlers and they thought shepherds were hustlers and they thought shepherds deserved to be with sheep and not with people. David, the youngest of his family, was relegated to the job of the lowly because of what his family thought about him. In fact, if you examine 1 Samuel chapter 16, you will discover that when the prophet comes to Jesse, his father's house, to find the next king, Jesse doesn't even think to bring David into the mix because his own father doesn't view him as highly as he should and does not think that his youngest boy would even be capable enough to get the job interview. So Jesse don't even submit his application. His family does not think very much of him. His, his, his job says very little of him. He is the youngest. He's so young, in fact, chapter 17 reveals that he ain't even old enough to join the military. Because in chapter 17, war has broken out between Israel and Philistia, the Philistine army. And the, and the children of Israel are at war. David's brothers have joined the army. They're in camp. David ain't even considered old enough to fight. So Jesse tells David, I need you to take these supplies, take this to your brothers. And he shows up to where his brothers are fighting and sees something strange. He sees, and I wish I had time to deal with this, he sees the Israelite army, God's people, cowering to a giant. When he gets to where he anticipates battle, he does not see battle. He sees those who signed up for battle scared to fight. He shows up looking to see a fight and when he gets there the people who are supposed to be fighting are afraid and they're afraid because on the other side of the battlefield it isn't just an army there's a giant a giant named Goliath who's massive he's He's, he's huge. The scripture tells us how big he is. Bigger than your biggest NBA player. He's stronger than anybody got armor that's, that's huge and heavy. So heavy in fact that he got to have somebody carry his shield for him. I mean Goliath is massive. It seems that the Israelite army, God's people, wouldn't have a problem facing an army. They got a problem facing a giant. Come here, come here, come here, come here. They don't have any problem seeing an enemy that they think they're evenly matched with. They got a problem with the fact that this enemy got something they can't measure up to. And much of the fear that exists in our lives is not 
happening or is not based on the fact that every now and then we come up against stuff that we feel like we can handle. Because if we be honest, every day you got to deal with something. Something at home, something on the job, something on your way home, something on your way to the job, something in the community, something on social media. It's always something, but there are some things you feel like you have the capacity to face on your own. Everything changes for some folk when they see a giant. Something bigger than them. And I think I'm on assignment today to talk to people who ain't looking at the army on the other side that you think you're evenly matched with. But at the same time, you see some stuff you got to deal with that you're capable of handling. In the middle of the stuff that you're capable of handling is a giant you feel like you can't. Because please note, Goliath wasn't by himself. In the middle of the army that they felt like they could handle was the giant that they couldn't. Come here. I know you can handle some of that stuff on your job, but there's a giant you feel like you can't face. And how do you handle life when you got to face some stuff you feel like you can handle and some giants in your face? Oh, you can sit in here and act like you got it all together but some of y'all are facing some financial giants. Some, some giants on your credit report. Some of y'all, some of you are facing some professional giants. You see the systems and structures at your job that seem to be turning their guns to you. It's, it's a giant. Some, some, some family giants, some, some stuff that's going to happen at your Thanksgiving table that you're really not ready to address. We're sitting in the face of a political giant. Yeah, we are. And, and, and how you handle the reality of your giant shows what you think about you and the God you serve. It, 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 it displays who you think you are and who you think God is. David shows up to the battlefield to see what he did not anticipate. Didn't see a battle. He saw God's people trembling in fear. What a picture to the world. What, what a sad picture when you see God's people, those who claim to represent the Almighty, trembling in fear of other principalities and powers. Shame on us for cowering to Christian nationalism. Shame on us to cowering to racism and sexism and classism. Shame on us for cowering to the giants of the culture when we claim to represent the Almighty. David does not like what he sees. He don't like what he sees. He got a problem when he sees those who claim to represent the same God he represents displaying it in the wrong way. I need to say it again. Y'all looking over me and I'm trying to look at you. Let me say it again. David has a problem when he sees the misrepresentation of the same God he serves. David says something's wrong here if we claim to represent the same God, but this how y'all acted. Come here. David said, I got a problem with it. Y'all saying we represent the same God, but this is how you're behaving. You can't tell me we represent the same God and this is what you're standing on. You can't tell me we represent the same God and these are your morals and your ideas about people. You can't tell me we represent the same God when we cower at the sight of the first sign of trouble. We can't represent the same God. And so David, one 
young boy decides to take a stand because God has a way of using willing people even if those willing people look like they're at a disadvantage. As a matter of fact, can I tell you that that's probably what qualifies you to be used by God. God likes to use people who look like the odds are stacked against them. And I don't have time to call the roll. I don't have time to go down the line. I don't have time to give you all the biblical history. But here's what you need to know. When God wants to use somebody, God typically don't use the one that everybody else thinks is worthy to be used. God doesn't typically typically use the one that look like they got it all together. God doesn't pick the biggest and the strongest and the fastest. God don't pick the most eloquent and the smartest and the one with the best education. God likes to pick the underdogs. And I stop by to talk to an underdog in the room who feels like you're disqualified because you're one person who ain't as big and ain't as strong and don't got enough money and don't have all the resources. If God be for you, Who can be against you? I came to tell you that you may look like an underdog to the world. But God has a way of choosing who the world looks over. This is all we know about David's story up to this point. Every time he's looked over, he's in perfect position to be used by God. And I know you've been looked over and left out and been last on the list. Here's the good news. You're in perfect position for an underdog story. David sees what he sees. Comes up with a solution. I'm, this is crazy, y'all. I'm going to go talk to the king myself. See, Y'all hear stories so much that y'all miss the shout of the story. David, a boy who was sent in the field at his own house, not qualified to fight in the army, gets the courage to go to the king himself to deal with an issue that the king himself was scared to handle. Woo! Lord, I wish I had time. Come here, lean in close. David, a young boy who was looked over in his own family, much less how he would be considered in his own country, decides to show up and go to the king to tell the king he was willing to deal with an issue that the king was too scared to handle. Come here, come here, lean in close. Can I tell you why some people don't like you? Some people don't like you because you're willing to deal with the stuff they are scared of and your success would highlight their failures. So, 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 some people have a problem with your boldness because your courage identifies their lack thereof. Some people have a problem when you speak truth to power because when you speak truth to power, it displays they're willing to go along to get along. And that's why I ain't scared of none of y'all. If God tell me to say it, whether you want to hear it or not, I'm going to say it because I refuse to be concerned with man's opinions of what God said. And can I just tell you, we need a few more Davids who are willing to display a boldness to go talk to people and, dis and display a willingness to take on stuff other folk ain't willing to take on regardless as to how they'll feel about it. And I need y'all to know before y'all shout too soon, 
He wasn't rude in how he did it. He didn't have to dishonor Saul to do it. Because some of it is because you display a good courage. Some of it is, though, because you display a bad attitude. Oh, y'all, oh, 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 see? That's why I told you I ain't scared of y'all. The reason why some people don't like you is because your boldness highlights their timidity and their fear. But some of it is because you still ain't learned how to show up and be honorable even when you disagree. You still ain't learned how to be respectful even when you don't like something. Yeah, yeah. David shows up to Saul, says, Saul, here's the thing, man. King, uh, nice to meet you, Doc. Um, I got a problem with what I've seen. But, but here's the good thing about David. David don't highlight a problem. David shows up to bring the solution. Here's the solution. Here's what David says. I got a problem. I got a problem that nobody wants to fight in battle. There's a war going on and nobody want to fight. I got a problem. But I also got the solution. Here's the solution, Saul. Oh, king, I'm going to go fight. I'm, I'm going to go fight the giant. Do, do, David ain't even old enough to be in the army. He's not old enough to be considered a soldier. And according to the description of David, David ain't a big fella. David's a small guy. That's a giant. The first thing Saul says is, you can't. You, you, you're not able. You see it in verse 33? You're, you're not able. You're not able because you're just a boy. And that's a grown man who has been fighting since he was your age. Okay. Y'all read too fast. David, you can't fight. Because you're just a boy. You're small. You, you, you're not old enough. And he's a grown man who's been fighting since he was a boy. One more time for the Holy Ghost. You're just a boy. He's been fighting since he was a boy. Meaning, and this is for five of y'all who will just shout about it, the only difference between Goliath and David beyond size was opportunity. Goliath got to start fighting as a boy, so you can't disqualify me because I ain't old enough yet you can't disqualify me because I ain't had an opportunity yet. All I need is somebody to give me the same opportunity somebody gave Goliath. Yeah, he's older and he's bigger, but he's been able to fight so long because somebody saw something in him at a young age that allowed him to get an opportunity he didn't qualify for. And can I pause parenthetically to say, some folk just need an opportunity. And that that's why we got to be real careful about what we allow in the world around us because the truth is the only reason some of us are marginalized is because ain't nobody giving us a chance. It's interesting to me that Saul does not bring up the difference in size, just the difference in experience. Is your Bible open? He does not highlight the obvious difference in size. He highlights the obvious difference in experience. Says he's been fighting since he was your age. 
you just a boy. You can't fight a grown man with that experience. David says, well, uh, 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 when you see me, you can only see me for what you see, not all the stuff I know. I got a resume beyond what you see. You see my appearance. You see I'm not big enough. You see I'm young. But what you don't know is, lean in close. Here it is. What God has allowed me to experience in the minimized places have prepared me for the big stage. Let me try it again. Lord, my soul getting happy. What God has allowed me to experience in the places I've been relegated to in the dark are the things God has used to prepare me to fight at this stage. What I experienced when I was relegated to shepherd duty prepared me for a fight with the giant. Come here. This is why you can't despise the places you're relegated to. Because people will push you aside because they don't think you're good enough. That's the only reason why David was in the field in the first place. David was a shepherd because he was looked down on. What they didn't know is when they sent them in the field, God was using the field of the shepherding to prepare him for the field of the battle. Woo! Can I just tell you, this is why you should shout about where God's placed you now. Because the stuff God is allowing you to see now is preparing you for what God's going to allow you to conquer next. Stop complaining about being sent and relegated to places of mediocrity. Because God has a way of using seemingly mediocre places to develop you for what God wants to do through you. Because y'all do know pictures only develop in the dark. Woo-wee! Y'all making me work this morning. I, and I came to tell you that God has a way of developing you in dark places. And a few of y'all can testify that the most exponential growth in your life took place in the spaces and the fields that other people didn't see. I wish I had time to testify. But if y'all only knew the hell I went through in dark moments, it wouldn't surprise you that I'm bold in public ones. Because you don't know the stuff I went through to develop in the dark. And that ain't just my testimony. If I had time to pass this mic around, some of y'all could say there's some stuff you went through when people weren't around that made you who God made you and strengthened you and shaped you and allowed you to know that there's more in you you than what meets the eye. Here's, here's what David says. David says, while I was relegated to tending my father's foolish and fearful sheep, this is what sheep are, whenever a predator showed up, lion or bear, and stole what belonged to my father. <laughs> I would go after it. Whenever a predator showed up to rob what belonged to my father, I would go after it. And when I would go after what belonged to my father, my intention was to take back what belonged to my father. (laughs) 
So whenever a predator would show up and take what was not theirs but belonged to my father, I would go after it to take it back. Somebody got to go get back what the predator is taking from God. Because there are predators and systems and structures and people that are trying to take from God's camp. Yeah. Yeah. The thief comes to There are structures at work seeking to take and pluck and rob from God's treasury. David said, I would go after it. When I would go after it, I would only have a staff. I went after it, and the only thing I had to go after it with was these tools that shepherds have. Um, <laughs> David will write about what these tools are in your favorite psalm. Right, right, right. David, the shepherd, describes God as the shepherd and then tells you what tools a shepherd uses. Yeah. Shepherds have a rod and a staff. They were intended... To comfort the sheep. But every now and then, tools of comfort had to be used as weapons of warfare. Y'all, I must I need to say this again. Listen to me. Every now and then, the tools meant to comfort the sheep had to be weapons of warfare against the predators of the sheep. The same things God intended to comfort you are the same thing God uses to afflict what would make you uncomfortable. So the tools of the shepherd would comfort afflicted sheep and afflict comfortable predators. Okay, all right, all right. You, you, know, you know what a weapon is that is meant to comfort the sheep and afflict the enemy? Prayer. prayer. Prayer is a weapon that is used to comfort the soul of the sheep while also doing warfare against the enemy. You, you know what a tool is that comforts the sheep and fight worship. Worship has a way of soothing your heart and shaking hell up. The David said, all I had to fight was what I had to comfort the sheep with. So when I would go after the predators, all I could do is take what I had and use it to strike the predator. Oh, God. All I could do is take what was in my hand and strike the predator. And here's the thing, y'all. They weren't weapons of war. He didn't have a bow and arrow to hunt the bear. He didn't have a sword to pierce the predators. All he had was what he had. But somehow or another, what he had was enough to get the job done. Y'all making me work real hard today. Come here. I need to tell somebody who feels like you don't have enough artillery, who feels like your weapons ain't good enough, who feels like your money ain't long enough, who feels like your education ain't long enough, who feels like your resume ain't long enough. It don't matter, baby. You can use what's in your hand to do what God's called you to do. And a few of y'all can testify what I had was enough. I wasn't the smartest, but it was enough to solve 
solve the problem. I wasn't the strongest, but it was enough to get the job done. I ain't have enough money as everybody else, but it was enough for me to get what I needed to get done. Is there anybody who can testify that when you use what you got in God's hands for God's purposes, God will use it to get the job done? He says, listen, what you don't know is uh, when I was out there tending my father's sheep, predators would show up. Predators would show up. And all I had was what I had. But what I had was enough to take back what belonged to my father and if necessary, kill the predator if it turned on me. Listen to what David says the intention was. I got to go. David says the intention was to get my father's stuff back. But if the predator turned on me once I did what I was supposed to do, if I had to defend myself, it was enough to get the job done too. Uh, I wasn't there to bother the predator. The predator showed up to bother me. And all I did was take my father's stuff back from the predator. But if the predator turned their guns on me, what I had was enough to defend myself too. Now, uh, there's a whole lot of um, theological implication or ways you can apply that. If y'all don't mind, I need to take a minute to apply it the way I feel the need to apply it today. <laughs> Pastor Aaron, when I woke up this morning, I said I wasn't going to do it. All I have is weapons to protect the sheep. But when you come at me, I got enough to defend that too. So somebody tell Donny Swagger, tune in. Donny Swagger, this white evangelical pastor had the unmitigated gall to get up in his church this week if you can call it a church and wage war on the black church he said and I quote they gonna call me racist and we are they gonna call me every name in the book and we should and then said, but somebody got to talk to and call out the black church. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Somebody got to call out the black church because the black church is ordaining and endorsing all kind of evil when they vote how they vote. Said out of his mouth, we're endorsing murder. Now, last I checked, if we want to compare the body count of who's got the most murders on their record, I guarantee it ain't the black church because y'all been killing us since y'all forced us here on these boats and you still laughing when we get gunned down in the streets and got the nerve to talk about we endorse murder? And while I'm here, allow me to suggest that there is a difference between being pro-birth and pro-life. There's a difference between being pro-birth and pro-life. Just because you'll fight to see us born and then kill us when we get here does not make you pro-life. 
if your policies ensure that we're marginalized and ostracized and have a lower quality of life, you don't get to open your hypocritical mouth and say anything about a church that stands for life. Hypocritical. Hypocritical. And let's roll down the lineage of your family. Hypocritical. Racist. Stepping on people just to gain more wealth and get on private planes and live luxury lives while you're ripping people off. Don't you start talking to us about what's right or wrong. You want to run the list of evils in the world? I can tell you where every evil, vile, sinful thing in this country started. And I guarantee you it wasn't the black church. Do some history. You'll discover that it was the white church that endorsed and still endorses slavery. Because the new slavery is found in Project 2025. The new slavery is found in mass incarceration. The new slavery is the stuff that's causing you to slant these standardized tests and line the pockets of your wealthy with the industrial prison pipeline. Don't talk to me about being pro-life. I got to go. I said what I said. And I'll add more to it before I take it back. Oh, and trust me, I got plenty to add to it. And if you're a visitor here, hello. I believe that justice work is Jesus work. Let me move. Come back next week. Pastor Aaron, don't look at me like that. Wasn't bothering him. Anyway, David says, the same weapons used to defend the sheep, I also use to defend myself. So you want to get up calling out black pastors and black preachers and the black church know that we got something to say. And we got receipts. Because in the words of the Reverend Dr. Freddie D. Haynes, wouldn't be a black church if the white church didn't kick us out in the first place. So y'all don't say I wasn't preaching the text. <laughs> David said the same weapons that I use to defend the sheep, I use to defend myself if needed. The Bible says that David then tells Saul, here's the, here's the heart of the text that I'm done, the verse we read. He says, uh, I've had to kill predators you didn't know about. I got a resume you didn't see, but here's what you need to know. Verse 36. I've killed lions and bears. Just because you don't see it don't mean I ain't been fighting. I've been fighting predators in places where I've been by myself. And that's somebody's testimony. You've been fighting predators in places they didn't even know you was out there fighting. They sent you out there and didn't know what you were fighting against when you went out there. You've been fighting, and here, here's the shout. And this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be just like one of them. 
Why was David so confident? Verse 37. I'm confident that I can handle the giant just like I handled the bear and the lion because I wasn't fighting alone. <laughs> Last year, or earlier this year, rather, during Super Bowl Media Week, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes was asked a series of questions before the game. And while they were asking him questions before the game, one reporter randomly asked him a very strange question. She says, Patrick, you've, you've played in a lot of these games. What does it feel like to be the underdog? The question clearly confused Mahomes. It confused Mahomes. Now, they were getting ready to play a really good football team, a team that had all kind of pro bowlers and people that got resumes and all that stuff and a great coach and all that. But you could see the question confused Mahomes. T.O., to the point where he says, uh, well, I, I guess... Being the underdog doesn't really matter to me. I've been an underdog before. Um, but I've never seen myself as the underdog. And I don't see us as the underdog because I know who's in this locker room. He said, I know the team that we have. And because I know who's in this locker room, when you put us on the field, I know we always got a chance. Now, this was an interesting answer for two reasons. Reason number one, it interested me, Theo, is because Patrick Mahomes says, I got confidence not in my ability. Patrick Mahomes is one of the most skilled quarterbacks we've ever seen. But his confidence wasn't in his ability. It was in who was fighting with him. Come on, catch up. Because David said, my confidence in knowing I'm going to kill this giant doesn't really have anything to do with how skilled I am with my weapons. It doesn't have anything to do with believing I'm stronger than what you think I am. It's because I know who's fighting with me. And as long as he's fighting with me, I got everything I need to win any fight I face. And I just need to know if there's anybody here who got the same testimony that says as long as God is on my side, come what may, I got everything I need. But T.O., here's the thing that really shook me. According to the odds, Mahomes wasn't the underdog. He was the favorite, meaning the reporter saw him one way, but that wasn't the only way to see it. And I just need to tell somebody who's been counted out, who there are people who told you you'll never be able to do it. You don't have the ability. You don't have the capacity. There's another report that says you're not the underdog, baby. You're the favorite. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? Because you're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're the lender and not the... Because you're more than conquerors through him that loves us. Because you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Will y'all help me close this sermon and tell your neighbor, neighbor? Y'all ain't saying nothing. Tell them, neighbor. 
I don't know what the world has said about you, but allow me to give you a better report. The better report is you got more for you than against you. The better report is eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered the hearts of man. The good things God has in store for you. Tell them, neighbor, I got a better report. You shall live and not die. Y'all ain't talking to nobody. Say, neighbor, I got a better report. Since you belong to God, you got everything you need. I got a better report. It ain't over till God says it's over. Tell your neighbor, I got a better report. You are victorious. You win because God can't lose. Tell somebody, I got a better report. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Now let everybody who knows in the end you win. Give God a shout. Come on, if you know how the story ends, if you know you're victorious, if you know ain't no giant, ain't no lion, ain't no bear, oh my, that can stop you from what God has for you, will you do me a favor and shout like you know that you already won?